But Eric Hundley has the whole has the whole monopoly. I don't know who that son of a bitch thinks he is. Welcome to Laid Back Law with your favorite lawyers from around the interwebs. No. Here's Morgan is doing the hide my boner lean. <laughs> Look at him. Look at him. I think this is actually the first time that a billionaire cut safety standards and it was the billionaire themselves that died. And that's what made that's what made Polyers. I don't even know how to pronounce this guy's name. Polyev. I am board certified criminal trial law in Florida. I'm your man. Of course, you have to compensate me. Discussing the most pressing of topics every Friday at noon Eastern time. I, mean, I, I did this way before him. I had the big brain panel before Eric Hunley even existed. I don't know who that son of a bitch thinks he is. I have no idea, man. I have no idea. It's one of my favorite clips of all time. You and Ricardo were well into your cups during oh, that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> during that bit, that was that was actually pre or right around Rittenhouse time. Frame. It was it was like three months before Rittenhouse. Back then, I had I had wow. like three thousand subs or so. So well, uh, th- things have changed. You're you're closing in uh, very quickly on a hundred k. Very, well, if, if that depends, very quickly is a subjective term. It's a very subjective term. I mean, yes, if you're looking at ge- geological scales of time, it's really, really quickly. Otherwise, not so much. <laughs> that's a, but that's okay. That's okay. I, I'm, 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 whatever, whatever God grants me is awesome, and and yeah, that's that's really perfect. Well, you you rushed behind or uh, past me. I'm going to start this show though a little bit off kilter, again, just because I I love having a a discussion like the past couple episodes, especially we've gotten into some philosophical discussions uh, from everything with the law. I, I mean, just period. So this one, I want to share this. I saw this literally on X earlier. I'm not trying to be judgmental, but I have feelings about it. And I think many people will automatically have feelings about this. And essentially, imagine, if you will, that you are arrested and your public defender is different than you might expect. I would I'm gonna play a clip and I want to see what everybody thinks about this. And again, I'm not trying to cause trouble, well, a little bit of trouble, but <laughs> I, I'm I, I, I genuinely am <laughs> curious. So here we go. Okay, let me check on that. Yeah, yeah. So we were talking in A6, 845? Yeah, yeah. That works for me. All right. Do I need this on the other hand? No. Just out of here. Your... Oh, oh, yeah. 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 My Looks like a PlayStation 2 game. Yeah. I just met her. She's really nice. She's really smart. She sounds like she's got the right idea about things. I really support what she's up to, and I think it's fabulous. How about that? God, it, is you, this a she's accused of, promise? what is it, criminal trespass. In the first degree, yes. Is she innocent or guilty? She's innocent, of course. She's innocent, okay. Well, no, just she's caught on video yeah. being arrested and protesting and allegedly protesting. Uh-huh. So I'm trying to. I, I want to play it out so people can hear the competence or non competence. It's not, you know, I, I just want to. You get all sides. So well, my client has pled not guilty. My name is Stephanie Mueller. I'm in the uh, directory for the Washington State Bar Association. You can look me up. Okay. So Stephanie, thank you for your time. At this point, it, your client is being arraigned, though. It's all just happened. Her, her hearing is over. Got it. It's done. All right. Do you know when her next court date is? I do. Do you? I'd like to maybe just keep tabs if they're. Uh huh. I think that's a great idea. Do you, could you tell me when that is? No. Oh, take okay. care. Thank you, Stephanie. All right. So, I am curious because. It is uh, of concern. I mean, I imagine myself <clears throat> as a defendant, and I'm terrified for my life. And who is representing me? Is this the best person? Will there be a, a prejudice against my case if this yes. person is representing me? Again, I'm not trying to be mean about it, but I'm just, I'd love to get people's thoughts. So I'll start with Joe, who always has a thought. Before you do, I need to be excused for a moment. I'm going to go get 80 milligrams of Xanax so that I can participate in this discussion. Hey, bring me some. Yeah. <laughs> I'll do a bump with you too, Norm. Yeah, no kidding. Wow. <laughs> Back to you, We Jeff. played like Zeppelin's whole lot of love. You know, that's what I'm thinking. Bump, 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 bump. 
What? 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 Do it. What? I just love his expression. I had to frame it for everyone. Oh my so, god. Joe. What? I know you have thoughts. What's to see there? Mount Rushmore mounted. I mean, you know, come on. You know? It's, it's not the size of the Kazangas. No one cares about that. That's not the issue here. Well, I have a no, question. That's not the issue here. <laughs> I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to tell you something. If that person was born with double X chromosomes and was putting that crazy clown level of lipstick on their face, I would still question their mental competence. I don't know. Maybe that's just me. I don't know. Am I the only one? I, 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 oh gosh. All right, go ahead, Phil. I'm the judge. I, I once had a young lawyer turn up with a tiara on. We were doing a murder case. We won the case. I had three lawyers with me. And oh, she's a kid, two, three years out of law school, got this tiara. I looked at her. I said, this isn't fucking Halloween. And I crushed her. I shouldn't have said it. It's another one of those stupid norm moments that I'm famous for. But that she thought that was appropriate courtroom attire. I thought it was distracting. That that lawyer distracts me for reasons that might I might get used to her in the same way. You know, I once had a person that worked for me who had horrible teeth. And for the first six months, I'd always stare at the teeth. Then I got used to him. Maybe you'll get used to that lawyer in time. I, I <laughs> yeah, never. Wow. It would take you know, it, you know we've all been called, you know, if you've ever done indigent defense or worked at the public defender's office, you get called the public pretender, right? So <laughs> does this does this give new meaning to the, the phrase public pretender? Oh, that's guys, a, gonna, it's a fair take, question. Andrea, I'm going to take a, a little bit of the devil's advocate position here because so please don't tell us one, this, is, this is Seattle Muni. Okay. This is Seattle Muni. This is totally fine in Seattle Muni. No, it's not. It's not totally <laughs> so, fine. Se anywhere. Second, second point. Second point is that, you know, when the, when the standard of what is all too often acceptable in courtrooms for public defenders is to show up, you know, hung over in your sweatpants. Uh, you know, well, that's okay. I, I, yeah, I mean, we're, we're, we're raising the bar a little bit here. Uh, my concern is always just, can you be an effective lawyer? And uh -huh. I see somebody who is advocating for the innocent of her client. She's taking no shit from the press. Uh, these, these are positive things in my book. So that's my two cents. Yeah. Speaking of raising the bar. That is Washington raising. Is the state that we just raising. talked about doing away with the bar exam, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So, I mean, let's just let any we have body bar license whatever the fuck here, wants which to is a, another point people. to you, Andy. <laughs> Okay. Um, all right. Now, that is an interesting point, Andrea. And this is why I want to ask, because I'm sure that where they are, like if I said this is San Francisco, that may factor in or all the above. But I do think it leads into a, a legitimate discussion about, you know, of uh, what is proper attire or not proper attire. I mean, it could well, be that is it, not proper attire. It could be my cousin Vinny, right? I mean, well, you know, we're going to talk about it. It is not your cousin. I, your cousin I, Vinny actually had decent courtroom attire. That guy, look, it was, it may have been old, but it looked, you know, mm -hmm. it looked better than what the judge was. I mean, it, it was, it was old timey, so to speak, but he had legitimate um, dress wear on. Like, and by that, I mean not a dress, but dressy. Uh, clothing. But here's a question, Phil. You're yeah. sitting in court listening to this case, and you no, know I'm not. I'm not. I'm laughing. Listen, because okay. I'm but laughing. once you run out of oxygen and you stop <laughs> laughing and you start listening, <laughs> do you forget? You know, does the does the person's appearance matter to you any longer? You know, I'm always amazed. Yeah, no, how, it does. Yeah. I mean, but doesn't there come a point where you just hear them and forget the presentation? No, because oh. when, because when they're when they're when they're that ridiculous looking, nobody can can focus on what in the hell they're saying. They could be saying so, brilliant stuff that's going to get your client or you acquitted or whatever. But if nobody's listening or paying attention to what's coming out of their mouth because they're staring at these uh, giant fake bazorganas organas uh, that look like, I don't know, maybe made out of wood or something and just sort of strapped on there. Um, it looks like a bicycle mm -hmm. ramp that's turned on its side and like, I don't know, like just how much wood could it strapped on there? See, I, I don't, I don't know that. I don't know that I agree with that either, because we can't look past. There is always a theatrical element to being in court. And if yes. you no. can grab the spotlight, no. you can be the center of attention. No. Then people are going to focus more on you. They're going to no. hear more of what you're saying and, and be more attuned to when you get up and speak <laughs> out. You you are getting attention. And this is not when they're this laughing. Is not any, this is not so, any, Andrea, any it's your I mean, child. You have like a Jackie Childs type of character, a Johnny Cochran type of character does this from the man's, you know, the man's standpoint. You dress very mm -hmm. flashy. You present yourself very flashy. Uh, 
you know, the, this Andrea. is... Andrea, this would, is would, dramatic. No. Andrea, Andrea, no. I, I want to ask you something. <coughs> would you yes. stuff a couple of beach balls in your shirt, shove your, and then wear cleavage down like that? I'm, I'm dare it's, say it's I'm positive my, you would not. I'm not positive. Not my style, you would not. Joe. It's not my style. Well, I, and I, what I'm saying is, nor would I. But there I, are plenty of women who will sexualize themselves in court. Oh my gosh! Mm -hmm. If you yes, have sir. spent oh. time in court, you have seen them. Not in the back, and they're not. That's true. And guess what? They're not a sex to represent your daughter. And your first thought yeah. is okay. I, I have a question. I'm going to push back on Norm just because it's fun. Um, you oh, asked a, a really valid good. point. No, I was saying, oh, is there a certain point that you start to hear the words or hear the message over time? And I think that's a great question. But I would also ask you this question Is it up to the defendant to allow, and how much time do they allow before the message actually gets heard? And it's, again, not prejudicial to their case. Because remember, I think the attorney is representing somebody else. So the person being represented could feel terrified for their life. And, you know, do yeah, they give right. it enough time? Or, oh, wait, no, if we have 20 more minutes, then they'll, they'll you know, the message will get through. Or is it 30 more? Or is it two hours? How, how long is it and what's reasonable? You know, I don't know the answer to that question. If I were on the bench and this person walked into courtroom to represent a client in my presence, I might call. I don't know what I'd do. I'd probably have an anxiety attack and call the judicial <laughs> conference up and say, what do you guys send somebody <laughs> quick? I'd be tempted to call people up to the bar, but I'd be afraid of stigmatizing and offending the outlandishly looking, uh, outlandishly dressed and um, lawyer. And I think that an equal respect for persons requires her regard, but I'd almost feel obliged to do some sort of canvas with the client. But how would you do that canvas without disrespecting the lawyer? You know, um, Mr. You know, Phil, I see your lawyer is here. Are you comfortable with her with her representation? No, she looks like a staff, a, a stuffed, a sack of stuffed mashed potatoes. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I don't know how I would handle that because I would be put off. But I can tell you this much. So I'm an old man with a ponytail. I've had this ponytail for 30 years. And, you know, I'm geriatric hippie now. I had a group of jurors uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a diner once after a case was dismissed. Uh, you know, we got a mistrial. And I walked in, I said, I got to tell you, does the hair bug you? And they said, that's all we saw at first until you started talking. And then we could not ignore the sound and power of your words. And so I believe that souls speak. They're encased in bodies. And if you reach a juror, you reach them. I wouldn't. I, I think I could get over her in a while. <laughs> um, it would take me a while, though. And, and, and in that moment, would I lose the jury? But if she spoke honestly, you know, you know, or I don't know how many of you have tried televised trials. You know, my first reaction to television cameras in a courtroom was I'm going to be hamming it up for the camera and it's just going to affect the quality of my advocacy. Am I going to worry about my big nose in a wrong angle? And what happens is once the hunt is on, once the questioning begins, once the exhibits are offered, you're considering evidentiary foundations. What's going to happen next? You lose yourself in the game and you become uh -huh. invisible. And I trust juries to follow the law and the evidence. So, you know, I'm, I'm sort of with Adrian on this. Well, you know, I mean, maybe I'm a fool. I'm an old fool. At well, that, but I, 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 I'm I, bugged by the woman. If it was my kid, I'd be outraged. You know, I'd go rob a bank to hire a private counsel if that was my private, my public defender. Um, man, there's nothing. Yeah. I would, my feet, I, I would not pass go. I would not collect $200. I would move mountains to go uh, beg, borrow, or steal money to hire private counsel. To You know, there's just no way on God's green earth I'm going to let that person uh that looks that caricaturish and outrageous um represent me when my life is on the line i'm gonna have somebody that looks like they are a uh look i, I don't want to be old-fashioned but i am old-fashioned so i'm gonna have somebody who looks like a traditional lawyer you can even have a ponytail that's actually traditional lawyer uh, but I'm going to have somebody that Thomas looks Jefferson. presentable to the court and it's not going to be distracting in the way that they, they dress. A no different matter way, what. Joe. That's well, a different yeah, way, guess, Joe. The, the, well, the he, had, he, had, he actually had a ponytail, Thomas Jefferson. Yeah. yeah. Right. But he also wore a wig, I believe, when he was in the uh, courtroom. Yes. So, uh, so I, a different kind of wig. Not this kind of wig, but, you know, kind of an old timey yeah. wig, shall we say. But the point is, the point is that you know people didn't wear where men wore ponytails back, you know, going back centuries. He also had problems with lice back then too, Joe. No, this uh, is true. I'm, yeah. so, I'm, I'm and, not and, sure. I'm not sure. 
<laughs> how, that, how that relates to to, to my well, point? They, they all a lot of more wigs and they buzz their hair down. I mean, yes, so that's, yeah, that was common. Men and common. women, by the way, I think yeah. women also shave their heads quite often mm -hmm. because of lice or whatever. And uh, the before thing, this I individual guess... turned toward the camera, when mm -hmm. I just saw the outfit and <laughs> and the uh, the Austin the ostentatious presentation from the side, I was like, I didn't. This, I was I was horrified. Because she does give like, new meaning to the term "tightly wrapped." Yeah, that's, that's what I'm saying. It's like it's like, and and, and I don't, I understand the concept of peacocking. I understand the, the necessity for for counsel and potentially, you know, especially if the if, especially if they have concerns about their client peacocking. I get it. I, I I understand that is a common phrase that they teach us in trial advocacy. So I I, I get it. At the same time, there's a difference between peacocking and parodying or clowning. And yeah, yeah. and it's not something. And I, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I I disagree with Andrea. I don't think that this is. Yeah, this, now well, look, you want to tell me you're playing to an audience, and it's on the West Coast and the you know, Northwest mm -hmm. part of this country that there might be a bias in favor of trans people, and that oh, and that making it rather evident that you're that you're a trans woman is a, a benefit to your client. Okay, look, you know that's a different culture over there. I can't. I can't claim that I have better insight on that. I'm simply saying, as 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 an attorney, I look at that well, and just the just the dress, just the the style of the dress alone. But how many I'm cases? Bored. How many cases has this person handled like this? Like this is the first one we've seen. To Andrea's point, is this the hundredth case that this person has appeared in court more or less like this, and it's going fine? I mean, I don't know anything about Seattle court, so I would take Andrea's, <coughs> um, what she says. Somebody about in it the chat, I think, but and, I wonder so about I, that. I, I, I would acknowledge too that that there there can be some issues with kind of courtroom <laughs> attire not, standards, yeah, yeah. particularly as they apply to women. You know, with men, the rules are are pretty clear. You know what mm -hmm. what the parameters are, what you're supposed to be. Uh, mm -hmm. With women, there is a lot more flexibility, and you know, there's a lot more. Uh, just yeah, here we room to play at the edges of what's appropriate and what's not appropriate. Um, yes. I'm not at all against having courtroom decorum standards, particularly in dress. I think it's just a challenge that, that courts always have to engage with um, because of Andrew, you know, the, about... the risk and the perception that you're being sexist with telling women how to cover their bodies. Yeah, and where do you I draw guess... the line on tennis shoes on men? I need to know. <laughs> In court, yeah. get out. <laughs> I wear them. I often come to. I picked a jury this week in tennis shoes and a suit. In Coburger, we have been criticizing uh, one one of the attorneys for the families um, for months because he wears these these like thick soled dock shoes that looks like you know you bought them off the clearance rack at Payless. That's what he wears to court. It's just appalling. We can't have this, guys. I mean, Come on, raise the cons bar. Cons 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 consider so, yes, this, consider thing. this, Andrea, for a second. Consider this is is come in style now among celebrities for women to literally wear nothing but underwear. Okay, mm -hmm. so imagine a lawyer walking into a courtroom dressed like today's celebrities, mm -hmm. and tell mm -hmm. me that tell me that that is not something which is representative of devolution of our society in that in that in a courtroom by an attorney that's considered. A, a tire, which well, we can we can we'll find some way to justify it as it's you know cleverly drawing attention. And I'm talking about a, a woman which is universally accepted as being attractive. You know, I, I, mm -hmm. it's still it's that's not something that we should look at and feel any other way than mortified as to what it represents about where our society is is headed. One yeah, I'm really, I'm really not disagreeing with you about that, Joe. I mean, I do think there needs to be standard of basic decorum in the courtroom. This is the institution. You need to show it mm -hmm. some respect. Uh, I think this is just kind of demonstrating what some of the problems are and really setting yes. those ground rules, particularly for women's attire. One last question. And this came in from the chat earlier. I just saw a flash by. What if the client was also trans? But it's still the no. dress. It's not. It's not yeah, about it's, being trans. It's, 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 it's the, the core. It's, one thing that we it's have the, there's just the over the top. I mean, it's like no, yeah, I, I'm being serious though, because th exactly. then it's like represent it. The I don't know. Appearance it, is one it, thing, right? We talked about we talked about the visual appearance, but in that video clip that you played, the volume creates an obvious contrast with the voice, mm -hmm. right? So, so the jury is 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 <clears throat> is experiencing a couple of yeah. things. So. First of all, public defender, right? There's already issues with access to justice, volume of cases. This person is uh, necessary for the fundamental administration of that office, clearly, right? And I don't know anything about this person's competence. I don't even know if this person was this person before 
the bar exam was passed and in in a in in they were allowed to practice law. But what I'm observing here is the highly exaggerated sort of hyperbolized version of femininity in direct contrast to what comes out of this person's mouth when they begin talking. Right. Mm -hmm. And as a juror, that's, that's why it's so distracting. A massive, mm -hmm. it, but we've only said stuff about the visual, right? The, mm -hmm. the issue with the dress is in and of itself an issue. But Andrea, to your point, there's already an issue with courtroom attire, particularly with women. So, you know, that in and of itself isn't enough. I would say that the exaggerated nature of the lipstick, and then as soon as this, the attorney steps up to begin presenting the case, answering the judge, doing whatever, mm -hmm. there's an obvious contrast that sort of just freezes the room and everybody in it long enough to be like, what is going on, right? Well, the lawyer shouldn't be, it should not be about the lawyer. It should be about the client. And yes. I, you know, I don't want to become the focus of attention unless I'm the one maybe standing there doing my closing argument or something like that. But it, it really is about the client. And I think when you, when you act and, and dress in a way that, and I, and I do think that it's not just the way that this lawyer was, was dressed. It's the way that he was acting as well. I mean, it's, it's, it's like the whole thing is just so over the top as to make it about him and make him the focus. It has a, it just has a bad feel to it. But I tell you what I have been seeing that more and more uh, yoga pants, yoga pants in court on attorneys. What are your attorneys? By law, oh, yes. Really? Norm, Norm, don't. Oh. Yeah. yeah. Now, Norm, I yeah. mean, <laughs> Steve, <laughs> Steve, uh, Steve's thinking <laughs> about it. I, so I know he's, Steve's thinking Eric, about it. I, I guess what you're saying, Eric, Norm's saying, going, like, I didn't know that was an option. <laughs> I, I guess, Eric, your question ultimately was this, was this attorney doing this to help their client if their client was trans to draw like attention away from their client is that what you were suggesting well i'm just or? saying they're representing i mean no offense but how many times do clients pick a lawyer to strike an image like uh let's say somebody who is accused of crimes against women picking mm -hmm. a female attorney mm -hmm. or somebody black having a black attorney or somebody white who has I, i'm just saying that, that, that sometimes the oh, yeah, identity of the attorney uh could be of benefit or what if the defendant was accused of crimes against a trans person maybe having a trans attorney could change things i don't know i'm just i'm trying to throw out because of that question alternative narratives or concepts that maybe could be creative all those are valid considerations those 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 are certainly something you'd want to consider when picking an attorney that 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 can be almost as important as any other thing you might have to deal with Right, in, the comments, in the comments, JL says in Tampa, there's women attorneys in yoga pants uh, in Tampa. So there you have it. It's real. I've seen oh. it. I've seen it in the yeah. metro Atlanta area, too. All right. Let's jump to what just happened this morning. Breaking news. I've got a bunch of super chats all on the same thing, including from Nate, the lawyer. Did Joe feel the earth move? Every day. There's a song about this. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> No, there was a 4.8 earthquake hitting Lebanon, New Jersey. Did anybody? We felt it in New Haven here. Okay. No, it, no. It, it sounded like a truck. It felt like a truck had passed. You get that low rumble. And I was on a Zoom call with some folks at Yale involving a Title IX case. It didn't and, just hit New York City. It hit Seattle, by the way. I'm sorry. And and, <laughs> and, uh, and, and, the, and the room started to move. And the lamp swayed a little bit. And the rumble lasted four or five seconds. And they had it over at Yale, too. So there, were, there was an earthquake in New Haven today. Okay. Okay. And I, I, I also want to get this one in. This is really um, very kind. Stephen Cooper, I think, is the first member on the Layback Law channel. Wow. And also gave away five other memberships to other people. And oh, the nice. memberships are just really a kind way of helping us out, <sighs> um, you know, helping keep this going, even, you know, oh, paying great news. Or great life. Uh, Mayor, uh, as far as the earthquake goes, Mayor Adams is on it. He's having a press conference. So, oh, okay. So, all this actually, well. the bigger, the bigger move. Actually, Phil, everybody, He's hold on. Joe, Carol King, City Joe, do you have? Do you? Have, are you behind this? Am I behind? Are, are you? Are you? Are your diggers? Is, is this their fault? Oh, oh God. <laughs> I think it's where our, our heart at work. I look, are they my, not? Are they not reading there. the geological maps correctly? The, and the memes going around are like um, are, are are pictures of like a lawn chair that tipped over, and it's like we can rebuild New York, like make, make it make it so. I'll, I'll tell you right now, I my my experience of this earthquake was that I was asleep, and 
all of a sudden, <laughs> a lot of people in my household are screaming, we just had an earthquake. Now, I'm going to tell you that the last, time, on time. the last time, the last time, New York, it's true, <laughs> it's so true. The last time New York had an earthquake was in, in April of 1986. I know this because back then there was a sec, there was another effort to troll me into believing that there was an earthquake. I am of the firm belief that this is a well-coordinated effort by thousands of people to troll me into thinking that every time I go to sleep, every 40 years or so, there's there's this some earthquake and everything around me is shaking. But I, I don't believe it. That's happened. true. I all 8.5 billion of us got together today and said, it's Joe's sleeping myth. in. How do we mess with his head? It's all a myth. So we all jumped in unison. Yeah. Oh, it, it makes and it made the earth move. It makes, it makes total, sense. It makes total sense to it makes total sense to me. So I say, well done, well played, very very well coordinated. But I'm not buying it. I don't think it happened. So okay. So just like Nick Ricada says that Australia doesn't exist, earthquakes. Joe doesn't York. believe earthquakes exist. I don't know. So. Earthquakes exist. It's not <laughs> not in the Northeast. That's all. They happen in Japan and they happen in anywhere along the Pacific border. You're you're in danger of an earthquake, but not not over here. We're good. No, the, honestly, the I, I was I was a little disappointed. I was down in Chile, you know, last a couple months ago, and Chile is like one of the most seismically active places on Earth, right? They don't even notice if it's like below 6.0. You know, they've mm -hmm. they've had nine point earthquakes in their history and stuff like that. And I was so disappointed. I didn't get a single single little shake the whole time I was there. Pacific. I told you, it's all along the yep. the. the the Pacific Rim. Pacific. Rim of fire. Okay, so um, now we'll jump into actual law, if we will. Andrea, Brian Koberger, I guess there's some kind of uh, update going on with his case. Yeah, so Brian Koberger had a hearing yesterday that was, uh, it was quite wild. It was, uh, it was very, very interesting to watch. Uh, so what's happened is that the defense has previously made it clear they're going to be moving for a change of venue. They don't think they can get a fair trial in, in Lataw County. And so in the background, you know, doing as defense lawyers do, they had gone and hired uh, a, an expert, an expert consultant who does, you know, public surveying for this type of thing. And this uh, expert had been performing a survey of 400 local residents in Lataw County. Well, uh, apparently, at least four of these residents uh, were alarmed enough about the survey being conducted that they contacted the prosecutor's office. And one of them even recorded it, gave a recording of this phone call to the prosecutor and uh, they become extremely alarmed and the state goes to court uh, on an emergency basis, gets an ex parte order from the judge basically saying, shut this down until we can have a hearing on whether this is appropriate or not. So there have been motions kind of going back and forth where the state is saying uh, this is a problem. This violates the gag order that we have in place in the case. Uh, the defense is saying you signing this order without any kind of notice to me is a violation of due process. I need to have notice and opportunity to be heard. You're interfering with my ability to, you know, make make my make my factual case for the, the remedy we're going to be requesting here. So it all came to a head yesterday at, at this hearing, um, which from a substantive standpoint ended up being a little bit of a nothing burger. We didn't get a ruling. They just kind of kicked it down the road to, to next week. We're going to have another hearing to talk about it some more. Uh, but it was just, it was quite fiery. The judge was quite offended at, uh, you know, I know what the rules of due process are. Well, yeah, judge, every judge on the planet says that we wouldn't have any due process case law if that were actually the fact, you know, sometimes you, you make bad calls and it's just, it's just the nature of the game. Uh, it's the defense's job to raise those kinds of issues. Um, and then the, you know, the uh, state is just pounding the table with how inappropriate these, these questions are. They were phrased. Um, so what had happened is this expert, he didn't have any access to the case materials at all. He had just gone to the press coverage for this market in Lataw County, looked at what some of the stories were and the facts that, that had been reported in that market. And they were asking the prospective jurors, have you heard, seen, or read these specific items that have been reported? Some of them are factually correct. Some of them are factually not correct. And so the, the goal of this seems pretty clearly to, to get a sense of how much has this information permeated the community, particularly this false information, and what sort of effect has that had on you know, the, the, the attitudes of, of prospective jurors as they'd be coming into the courtroom. So uh, 
we were really hoping to hear from this expert. She had him available to testify, uh, but unfortunately, for whatever reason, made the decision not to call him to the stand. So we didn't get to hear his explanation for why do the questions need to be this way? Uh, to me, from a practical standpoint, it's it's kind of clear. Like if you're if you need to ask about the bad press, you have to talk about the bad press. I mean, you can't you can't get an effective bit of information by just asking people, well, have you heard about the case and can you be fair anyway? Which is kind of and the judge always like to handle that that type of questioning you know, in, in the voir dire sort of context, uh, because nobody is ever going to say, oh, no, I can't be fair. I can't put this stuff aside. So just a very interesting hearing with a lot of takes on on all sides about is this is this appropriate? Is this tainting the potential jury panel? Uh, you, you know, is this is this necessary for the defense to be able to 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 make their make their argument? Um, and we will look forward to more on that next week. All right. Um, anybody have any thoughts on that or ideas? And Norm, have you have I know you've done so many high profile cases. I, I'm not sure if you've done the um, more than everybody here because I don't know everybody's background. But have you ever had a case with a Brian Koberger level um, defendant? Not that I mean, the Fotis Dulos case, but he committed suicide before trial. Um, Alex Jones, I mean, certainly that was wild. It wasn't criminal, but the 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 uh, and the Proud Boys case was extremely was extremely electric. Um, and, you know, what happens in those cases, it's almost a sickness. You know, in the normal case where there's no media, no buzz, you walk in and you're yourself. There's an electricity in the air in these cases where people get a little crazy. And so in the Jones case, you know, it was an electric environment. Uh, voir dire was difficult. Um, and, the, and the aftershocks hold remain on, still. On. Vor dire. Yeah, you're, so you're from, <laughs> no. you're from the other no. side. Vor Voir dire. Voir dire. Voir God says it like we did. This will be the controversy Vardier. of this you show. you got to have five <laughs> syllables <laughs> in all all of here. Okay, jury selection. Let's simplify it. But, <laughs> but the the Alex Jones aftershock continued to exist in Connecticut. This week, I was picking a jury in a in a black money fraud case in Danbury, two towns over from Sandy Hook. And judge says, "Does anybody recognize anybody in the case?" First jury, I recognize him, so I stand up. I said, "How do you recognize me?" You're on television all the time. You oh really? What in what? And he mentions the Alex Jones case among others. So I say, would it surprise you to learn I've received thousands of pieces of hate mail in the Jones case? No, he said. D did you send any of those? And he says no. But I said, I'm guessing you might agree with some of them. And he says yeah. And I said, well, would it surprise you to learn that I'm just a lawyer doing his job, and like any other man, I just want to love and be loved. And that put no, it stopped him for a I moment, love it. dead I in love his it. tracks, and it reframed things. And in the end, I sat him as a juror, even though he might have had bias initially. But I was able to cut through the electricity, cut through the noise, and reach the person. And I think that's the essence of voir dire. I call it bounce. Um, when you get honesty back from a juror, they're prepared to listen to you, and you go all in on that. So I was really grateful to that juror. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, I'm curious about this. Um, about your story here with with turning a, a potentially hostile juror into being less hostile I'm, strategically i just want to i want to consider this the concern that i think many litigators may have if you're coming across someone who let's say has particular bias against you or your client is that if you take steps during the course of this voir dire to to reframe their thinking is it not possible that the judge will see them showing some give. And even if you don't feel confident that they actually have done, you know, if not a 180, at least a 90 degree turn back towards centrality, that you think that they really only moved 10 degrees and that they still pretty much can't stand you and or your client. But the judge sees that little bit of wiggle. And when they see that, they feel like, okay, this is someone who's trying to be fair. And even though they're, they're coming in, with a hot attitude against you and or your client, that the judge will see that wiggle from them and then feel that this is someone who is bought, is is acceptable and you have to burn a peremptory to get rid of them rather than if you leave them in that blackened state without trying to reform their position, that the judge will see that and knock them off for cause and save you a peremptory. 
So that's well, my here's question. the problem. On an, on an individual idiosyncratic level, I might not have made the investment. But trying a case two towns over from Sandy Hook where people are still red hot angry right. um, and the Alex Jones factor remains a real factor for me in my home jurisdiction. I felt it needed addressing um, because and I, and I wanted to experiment to see if I could vet, you know, bloodlet it, as it were. Now, Connecticut is unusual among every jurisdiction in the world. We have individual sequestered voir dire, that me, or voir dire, meaning we can question each um, <laughs> each juror in this voir dire, one hey, at a time hey, outside uh, the presence of others during voir dire. And you can spend a half an hour to an hour with each juror. So it takes three, four days to pick a juror in the simplest case. Um, and so, you know, in, in group voir dire, it can work somewhat differently. Here's a great story where I had to take a judge on. Many years ago, I had a guy named Kevin King. Uh, this was my first case that got me on, on national news. You know, 1999, Kevin King faces the death penalty for the rape and murder of his 16-year-old girlfriend one Christmas season as she babysat her three-year-old sister. Uh, the state sought death, didn't get it. Kevin got life without possibility of parole, was on his way to the supermax when he decided he's got one less bid for freedom. So he studied the guards at the county correctional center, identified a guard who had a similar body type to his, listened carefully, found out what car the guard drove, then lured the guard into his cell, demanded that the guard give the uniform. And when she didn't, he shanked her in the chest, tied her to his bed and put her uniform on and made it to all but the last checkpoint. Super nice guard, guards, folks. Super nice guy. When the guard, when the guard, <laughs> there's a story here, Eric. When the guards <laughs> spotted him, they chased him down and he fell on the shank. It went into his chest and then the guards beat him. So this is where I enter the case. The public defender's office calls and said, would you consider bringing an Eighth Amendment claim against the guards? I said, hell yeah. So we sued the guards and we brought this case into federal court and we do the voir dire, the voir dire group voir dire. Yeah, and I basically give this run, rendition of the case. And I said, how many of you people think he had the beating coming? And about half the panel raised their hand. And I picked the angriest guy in the room and I said, tell me about that. And he did. And I asked, and I had a couple of the jurors talk to one another and the judge calls me up, Norm, 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 we can't have these people sit. I said, look, you call the balls and strikes. You let me try my case back off. Now it helped. I knew this judge pretty well. Um, he married my second wife and I didn't, the marriage didn't last and the judge is now dead, but Hey, it's life. Um, so he, so <laughs> what kind of in-laws does that make you? <laughs> yeah. So, so once I used those jurors and vetted their anger in the display of, in the presence of others, I said, those of you who didn't raise your hand, are you persuaded by these folks? And they didn't say anything. I said, can you see why these men pointing at the prison guards, uh, why these men were hoping for these folks on the jury? And they nodded their heads. And then I got rid of them all peremptorily. I tried the case to a jury, putting my guy up in chains and shackles in his prison orange. And he got a $2.15 million verdict, $2 million in punitive damages and 150 for a broken <clears throat> orbital socket. And it was because we were honest with the jury. We got okay. to express so, honesty. No, Joe, so, yeah, Joe I, 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 can, I can, I have a little bit of a, a, a war story too to kind of address your, your question that you asked, which is going back to my very first jury trial ever when I was a little baby lawyer in misdemeanor court, and uh, we just miss who? General, uh, <laughs> He's making a joke. Go, go. Oh. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That's my bad. And you can't uh, me anywhere. So we, d we just do general, you know, general voir dire of the room. It's only like 40 people or something like that. You know, very small panel. You get six jurors in misdemeanor court. And one of the people on the panel in early position is a retired sheriff deputy from like Oklahoma or something like that. Spent 20, 25 years on the force. And um, we're just going through kind of the general talking about what is it, you know, what does it mean to be a juror? You know, how, how important is it to be to be fair and objective? And what does that mean to you? Just, you know, very, very general types of things. And this guy is very talkative and I'm able to have a conversation with him and uh, it works out pretty quick where we, I, you know, I figure out I, I like this guy. This guy likes me. Like we understand each other. We can, we can communicate on, on, the same type of level. So I could just tell he was going to be receptive to what I was going to say. I have my supervisor sitting in here with me because it's my very first trial. He's like, you know, obviously you're going to get rid of this guy. No way. I'm going to, I'm going to, I, th I think, I think I'm going to go ahead and keep him. And I did, I kept him on the jury. Everybody thought I was out of my mind. He ended up my four person and he gave me the acquittal. So I think there really is power to being able to take that person who, 
you know, you might think at, at first glance they're they're going to be biased against you, but if you can make that connection with them, that's really kind of what it comes down and to. And that's bounce. It's bounce. That's bounce. What yeah. you just described is bounce, and you know it when you see it, and you got to yeah. trust your gut. Okay, this is this is the point. This is the point I'm making. I'm not questioning your decisions to put these people on your respective juries. I'm not questioning that. I'm saying in each of these cases, you're talking about successful instances where you manage to actually turn the potential juror into someone who went from being disfavorable to favorable. So that's that's different than when you may not have that success because the person is on full tilt in levels that that exceed that. What I would agree with you is 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 this as far as just a strategy for a litigation attorney is that if you have a voir diary where the um where you're working for yeah. <laughs> diary i was, I was giving i was giving Boy, you <laughs> oh, to, to an extreme was, yeah. 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 If, you, if you have a voir, if you have a public voir dire in front of in front of dozens of jurors in that case when you're having a conversation with one potential juror you're not simply having that conversation with that one person. You know you're being eavesdropped by the other dozens of potential jurors. So now when you're having this conversation and humanizing yourself to this potential juror, you're humanizing yourself to the entire room. And if there are others in the room who you're anticipating may be hostile because of your history or your client's history, in that case, you now are doing effective litigation in that you are now presenting yourself as a human to people who have looked at you as a monster. So I think that, that in that setting, it makes a great deal of strategic sense to try having a dialogue with one potential juror, one of the earlier ones, so that this way perhaps you're actually having a positive influence on the entire pool. In contrast, if it's a one-on-one -on -one conversation with a juror, with a juror like you were describing, um, Norm, in that case, I think that to me that's much more questionable because of the concerns that I raised earlier. Does that not make sense as far as that you're pitching to a whole room versus pitching to one person? You know, I mean, we do it. I've I've picked group in federal court and in other states, and I've picked individually. I mean, th the point you make about others participating in the conversation, I, I rely on body language. Look for closed body language. That's usually an angry person. So you and I have a discussion, and the guy over there in row two is doing one of these. You know, I, I'll mirror him so he knows I'm looking at him, and I'll say, you know, what do you say about that? You know, Steve? Fuck you and the horse you rode in on. And, and what do you <laughs> no. have against horses, you know? You know? <laughs> okay, quite, quite, I, I want to question you about the body language because i talked to a ton of body language experts and what you just described according to scott rouse who used to do um, record deals with producers mm -hmm. that would be the language he would actually look for in a positive nature and, and the mm -hmm. reason he, he put it that way is that Whenever he was putting up an artist to get a record contract or whatever, everybody's like, oh, my God. Oh, man. Fantastic. Just the best. They're amazing. Wow. Oh, check them out. They're cool. And then it'd be somebody in the back going, hmm. And they'd be like almost um, concerned looking. And as he put it, that would be interpreted by most people as this is a person who's closed off. But in this particular case, that individual is thinking, do we have the budget for this artist? Do we have that? And everybody else is full of shit and just, you know, papering them over. So I'm just curious if there are ever times that you might have a counterintuitive, you know, kind of like the uh, yeah, absolutely. crossed arms or, uh, well, you know what? So I'm Jerry tired. Spence, Jerry Spence used to teach the following at his ranch out in Wyoming. He'd talk about the magic mirror. And if you're feeling something when you're open and communicating to another person, odds are the other person is. And so mirroring is trying to reflect the other person's energy or body language to let them know you're attentive to them. So in the example that you're questioning me about, Eric, it could be a person thoughtfully engaged and ready to fall in love. It could be hostility. It's not open, however. And so I want to acknowledge yeah. his presence by that and then see where it goes from there. Um, if it's hostile, he may not open up. Um, he may decide to consider the claim and decide they don't have the budget. But I need to get to him, and because I need to know where he is. I think we're all fund we all fundamentally remain bats, and we operate by you know means of sending sonar out to see how we're connecting. I I want I want open people, um, and you know if somebody's closed, and you know we always I always teach the young lawyers in my office. When you stand in front of a jury, never cross your arms. Don't cover your nuts. Um, you know, I tell them, you know, stand with your hands at your side and your palms open if you can do it without feeling contrived. And the mantra I tell people is, you know, 
you know, crucify me. Here I am. Be open and be vulnerable and people will come to you. People want to rescue you. So, I mean, I, I'm no expert on this stuff, Eric. These guys, the guys you're talking to have written books and done studies. Mm -hmm. I just go to court and, 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 and operate intuitively and I lose a lot of cases. So, you know, I might be full of uh, hot air. No, but no, I think I'm, I'm interested in the different angles. That's why I asked yeah, the yeah, questions. Yeah. But I want to shift to because um, this shows about sometimes changing minds. And it's it's very helpful. Today, we changed one of the lawyer's minds. And Steve has determined that this is his uh, tire next time he goes into court. <laughs> so... Nice. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to shift on because Steve will have to buy that somewhere. It's also known as uh, merch, but we'll then use that as a, a brilliant segue into our next subject, which is the Funny Willis merch store. Oh, yeah. I'm going to be kidding. No, no, no. This, <laughs> listen. Okay. So <laughs> is this real? I need another Xanax. This is real. <laughs> this, okay, no, so. this can't be true. <laughs> no, nope, this is true. So I was someone who shall remain oh, nameless Jesus. brought this to my attention just about an hour before we came me on. dead. <laughs> and I, I could I mean apparently wow. anytime anything oh. breaks uh good, bad, or or weird related to Fanny Willis, somebody is gonna send it to me whether I know them or not. Phil and uh, and, I'm, and look, I'm the alliteration. Not on, I'm not on Facebook, so this one would have uh, this would just have it's just gone past me true. unless somebody but apparently so this is my twitter feed that uh that's up here on the screen and i i went ahead and i linked to the, the official fanny store but anyway uh she has her own merch for sale uh these are some quotes i found sip with integrity the official and it it, it doesn't say the official fan store it only it says the official fanny store literally so this first picture here this is her facebook right this is her face and it says uh, you all have been asking, so here you go. And it, and it puts the link to it. I also, for those of you who want to go to my Twitter feed at Phil Holloway ESQ and find this, you can link on it right here. Uh, in fact, can we? Is, is that on the screen, Eric? There's a fanny pack at all, but not an actual fanny pack. It, it, the, um, your Twitter feed, <laughs> whatever your screen is on. Okay, so you can see these items that I'm looking at here. We've got yes. the chill wine tubbler. We've got the fanny tea crop. Couture. John uh, Adams is now turning in his grave saying, I defended people in Boston for this. Yeah. You and know? oh, here we got the Fanny fan. Wait, there pack, is a Fanny. Pack. Fanny pack. Here, I think you're on a different screen. I, I'll there. go and uh, I got it up on mine. So here, here we go. Oh, okay. um, yeah. Here, here you go. You're, you're Fanny go yeah. to team. So I, I guess Team Fanny, I guess there's going to be a lot of guys buying that. You know, there's a lot of guys on Team Fanny. Is First it cash team. only, Phil? What's the candle? Oh, no, it's, <laughs> you get it all, it's no. Oh, it's oh, no receipt. Baby. Boom. No receipt. Boom. Yeah, it's yeah. Oh, oh, oh. No, she didn't. Of course she has. And then there's the Fonny Willis uh, there's chastity there's belt with a big pack, knot folks. on it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. There's a Fonny pack. You can't make this up. Um, <laughs> Mike, yeah, get us some of that swag, buddy. Apple, oh, and like, apple I mean, harvest. There's, Look, the, the, there's the a wine glass in there. It says sip with integrity. It's It's crazy. I actually think this could benefit trump because oh, do you think <laughs> he brought an application he look ashley merchant brought an application when she brought that motion the court ended up rejecting all the claims that that this was motivated for popularity and her own ascension and here she's trying to capitalize on it mm -hmm. and very overtly trying to capitalize on it and you can understand the logic of the, of the judge when he said well i'm going to fixate on the impact on the romantic relationship and the financial benefits that they're from and the reason that i speculated and i could be wrong but this is you know one 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 person's speculation that the reason i think judge mcafee probably speculated on that <laughs> is because if you're a judge sitting and watching something like this you know that Whoever is bringing this case is going to go into the public limelight. Anytime any celebrity or, or a huge politician is brought up on charges, you can they have every justification that they can try and claim that the reason this was done was that the person who's prosecuting me can, can gain their own fame and notoriety because mm -hmm. I'm someone who's very polarizing. A lot of people love me. A lot of people hate me. So that's that they're trying to ride the coattails of my fame. So any anyone's going to make that claim, but does that mean they should be free from prosecution ever? Obviously not. They could, they could merit jail time. So because of that, the judge can't really pay attention to claims that like, well, Fanny did this because she's looking at, because she's looking 
looking at famous because if indeed these charges had legitimacy, which they don't, but if they did, in that case, someone's got to prosecute them, and whoever prosecutes them is going to become famous. So what yeah, but how about some modesty? Wait until after the case. Before but my point, count, no, and that's why. So now when she's going around on these different circuit tours, you can understand why it's like, okay, well, once she's once that person becomes famous, whoever it is is probably going to end up doing circuit tours. So I'm not going to hold that against the, the DA. But now that the DA has gone to the next step of financially capitalizing on it by, by opening a merch store, that reveals that there's that there's an intent for her to use her fame for her own political, I'm gonna political hold and, and financial gain. Excellent this is a four, this Excellent is this point. feels like a four chan troll so much though. I, I I really would like to it says it says it's going to her campaign. campaign. It says the oh, proceeds okay. fund her campaign. But but hold on, if I wanted to really mock her maybe i would open it and then donate the proceeds to her campaign it could be equally damaging uh to her even doing that so okay. i i yeah, i, I, eric, I eric, get eric, the possibility eric, eric your question is uh, that's a question of fact as to whether or not she's actually behind this or not so if yes. you're correct that she's not behind it in that case, it, it wouldn't have any relevance to, to this particular case. But if indeed she is behind this, my point is that this now reopens that motion and to say that now based on new facts that have mm -hmm. that have that have changed in the wake of that motion, that the judge must reconsider that motion and say, hey, this is not a woman who's looking for justice. This is a woman who's looking to enrich herself financially. I, I agree. I, I'm Aaron, just trying to cover my own ass and acting like a journalist, right. which many people don't, well, and say, why. hey, there's a possibility here. Well, then let her disavow it. Let's, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And I, maybe I you should, in, it, maybe, you know, here's the deal, Eric. You've got some clout. Issue an invitation. <laughs> Have her appear next yeah. Friday so well, we can discuss the funny merch is, bill hook me up funny gates <laughs> well, eric i i was gonna bring this up but somebody else brought it up in chat um do you remember brian bosworth the football player back in the 80s oh, yeah. he sell t-shirts saying i hate brian bosworth well brian bosworth is paying a guy to go out and sell the t-shirts like i would laugh <laughs> i hope trump is behind this and he's just raking in money off of it <laughs> Now he's yeah, making too much money selling the Bible. You know, I heard that his Bible, well, uh, the, yeah. the endorsement of the Bible is pretty well. 60 bucks for the Bible, 75 cents you get a fire extinguisher in case the thing bursts into flames, you know. I mean, his I, <laughs> Donald Trump endorsing the Bible just that's oh, that, that that that's like funny in her merch page or, you know, the, yeah. the trans lawyer. Speaking of grifting. Yes. Thank nice. you very much FFM 2.0. With, uh, with, with, with Panda your, uh, Sean there on the yes. for his... Eric, look at your text message and see if you feel <laughs> better about my source. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Uh, well. <laughs> wait, so... <laughs> you, uh, I got to track. So, wait, it's legitimate, but, Phil? Is it legitimate? It's a picture of Phil and me, wait, hanging out. Do you no, believe my, do you believe my, do you, my source? You... I, I just share with Eric. It says, oh, okay. it her, it, you know, it's it's advertised on her Facebook with a, oh, disclaimer, okay. well, saying, then... with a disclaimer saying that it's going to her campaign. So, Oh. Eric sees who my source is, and I don't know if it makes him feel better about it. Oh, of course. Um, again, but I, I always have to throw out there, and part of the reason I, I yeah. will do this is I'm, I've been researching a lot on Gamergate, and I know everybody here is a hardcore gamer and can totally relate to it, and you're, you're very yes. in touch with the importance, which I would argue Gamergate actually is extremely culturally important and has been Critical. for a while. Especially but, in history, it will be. Um, well, but people don't realize, you know, uh, the game industry is actually larger than Hollywood and the entire music com uh, industries combined. It, it is very influential. Mm -hmm. But there's so much garbage going on um, with all these companies, with the DEI and these ad campaigns to show, you know, how how in touch they are. However, these campaigns will run these DEI ads here that are so LGBTQ friendly and always on point here in America. But yet, when we go to China, they remove black characters from a Star Wars poster and things like that. Because, well, we don't want to do that for the Chinese market. And they definitely don't want to do it for the Middle East. And I got thinking in my mind that it would be an amazing underground campaign to take ads that are being run in the United States, South America, Europe, that are extremely provocative to certain crowds, if you will, translate them, print them out, and then buy billboards in all these other countries on the down low so they could be properly represented universally. I just thought that that would be an interesting underground campaign. And I guess that was in the back of my mind when I was thinking about this being a perfect troll that somebody could do to somebody else, like the 4chan, it's okay to be white, or things like that. 
So I admit I have strange thoughts. Everybody's quiet. I love to <laughs> call that my mic drop. So, you know, I had a weird experience with a juror this week. I love picking jurors. You know, you get to meet perfect strangers. And and the number of people, you know, we probably talked to maybe 40 people this week. The number of people who pay no attention to the news, who are totally unplugged from the world we're all taking for granted here is astounding to me. And a sign of hope that there's life out there. But there's also death. One young person gets on the panel. She has a ministerial job. And the guy, the prosecutor asks her, what do you do in your free time? She gets home. She goes home. She eats dinner with her parents and spends all evening, every evening on TikTok. And I'm like, hmm, there's that sounds like spiritual poverty to me. So I get up and I try to get some bounce with this woman. And I won't say she had the flat gaze of a sociopath, but I couldn't get through. No, I couldn't get. Look, there's Andrea's smile. Andrea's smile. Yeah. That's a living thing that, you know, she's alive. She's present. This woman was like, she was like trying to figure out where I fit in the emoji scale. And it was really, really sad. And so, you know, to your point, you know, um, uh, Eric, about what goes on online, I think there's a whole subculture and universe out there of people who, for whom social media is their primary reality. And they're, they're sort of two dimensional people because you don't get robust human contact. You know, Mike and I have a rolling debate on our podcast at Law Pod Daily. Um, uh, but, you know, Mike is oh, very concerned oh, oh, oh. about. <laughs> Can I, what? Eric, I got I've got a follow up. Oh, I've, I've oh. just I've, I've just been able to confirm. So I'm looking at some uh, Fanny Willis uh, email coming from her. <laughs> it's it's someone uh, Matt. In fact, it's going to be my guest on my channel. We're going to be talking about the the hellhole, the the death trap that is the Fulton County Jail with uh, my guest Rachel Kaufman on Sunday. And Rachel just uh, sent me this. It's an email from Team Fanny uh, introducing Fanny Friday's gear up and show your support. Good evening, friends. Uh, we it does it calls it the official Fanny store. You can't really see my phone too well, but. It's confirmation this she's emailing this this is the legit part of her campaign it's well okay the, it's legit the official it's a fanny part of, I don't store. Legit. <laughs> i don't think what? anything about her is legit well including it's, cash in the house it's the official <laughs> like fanny the store club at the airport <laughs> All right. um i know yeah. mike's gotta jump off uh mike you've been quiet yeah. so, well eric uh, so. i was gonna have norm finish uh the plug about what he and i argue over on the uh on the on the stream but i will say that i may have more to offer on this topic in the coming weeks and months one of my uh i'm a transactional business lawyer one of my clients just um, issued a press release for a product that they're building with the association of tennis professionals atp and it is you know within the gaming industry so i'm going to be immersed in this uh in the Ooh. next several months so i may have yeah, more to offer as we, uh, please as we clear these hurdles uh please Eric, yeah, I'm, I'm doing interviews on the side on that so yeah yes i'm i'm looking up Guess so, what, Eric? Every Friday, you can add to the show now because uh, Fanny is, wants to contribute. It says, we're introducing Fanny's Friday, a weekly event where we'll be adding a new exciting item to the store every Friday leading up to the election. So mark your calendars and don't miss out on these weekly drops. Norm, do you have some Xanax for a friend? I, I, I'm just thinking, what's her next product? You know, the Fanny Thong, a Fanny Gavin, Fanny, you know, fan, you know, Fanny. I don't know. I mean, she's already done the Fanny pack. Where yeah, are you going to go think from there? Now, you know, <laughs> let me tell you the jingle that comes to mind: beans, beans, the musical fruit. The more you eat, the more you toot. I mean, we're going to have Fanny fart gear soon. I just, I just can't cope with the universe. Oh, don't in give which her ideas. Norm. The Fanny Thong. So listen, I got to run, guys. I'm heading up to Northern Vermont. We got a foot and a half of snow this week. I got to go clear it up before my daughter arrives, so that we can view the eclipse All together right. and feel the earth oh, under our feet. Thanks for having me, guys. I'm out as well. Go back to see an arm. Go back this weekend. I'm out as well. Thank you, Eric, right, as right. always. And thank you, all. Right. Joe. Awesome interview with Norm last night. If anybody oh, hasn't watched that, you. that was thank you very much. Well, I, had, I had a great time. It was awesome. Steve, I'll sure. talk to you. Bye, everybody. See you. Bye. See ya. And everybody check out Law Pod Daily. There's a link in the uh, description. As a matter of fact, there's a link in the description for everyone here. All you have to do is click the name. It'll take you right to the channel, and hopefully you'll consider subscribing. Mine's even on there. And uh, you know, if you don't mind, while you're here, you know, perhaps we don't need to look at Joe. Um, you can remember <laughs> to subscribe, and we do this every week. Every week, <laughs> people have you know. <laughs>
they sullied themselves to come here, and I deeply, deeply appreciate it. So, um, next up, and Dustin. Dustin is a regular on um, this channel, another channel. Had hip toss a few old ladies out of the express lane at the grocery store but made it to the show. Awesome. <laughs> what, 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 percentage, what percentage of society do you think are these NPCs that Norma was describing who basically spend their entire life like just – completely immersed all their downtime aside from they work and then they're on social media or in 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 let's say games even like like where they basically have zero social interaction do you think that that's it's the majority high level do you think it's the majority getting, of american society or not it's getting it's getting bigger i don't know if anybody here um is kind of in the same algorithmic circles as i am but uh jonathan jonathan Haidt is a social psychologist yes. who's written a mm -hmm. lot about uh, this particular topic with children in particular, kind of the, the childhood being taken over by the screen and the, the potential effects that that has had. He's made a pretty strong case that, you know, you can attribute some some causal uh, connections to things like, uh, it, you know, problems with mental health and, and just maladjustment and, and stuff like that. Uh, that's directly re related to all of this time that that children are now spending uh, on social media. So it's it's very much like an emerging topic, and a, and a lot of um, good conversations are being had about it. There was one recently that he just had with Tyler Cohen, um, who's another uh, another just thinker that I follow. Um, he's the Marginal Revolution um, blogger, like economist uh, ty type of stuff, and very kind of libertarian uh, minded viewpoint. And so he's given Jonathan Haidt, I think, some pretty good pushback from a, you know, well, what what do you do from a liberty standpoint? You know, are you gonna are you gonna like tell people how to parent their kids? Are you gonna shut down, you know, social media access, stuff like that? I mean, it is a big problem. Like, how do you with this technology that I mean, it's kind of addictive, you know, that's sort of how it's made. That's part of the problem with it is, is that it's, it's literally designed to suck you in and, and to keep mm -hmm. you, keep you engaged with it at the potential cost of, you know, your, your Living. real life, your, yeah, yeah. Your, your actual real world out here. And, and especially now as, as children are kind of being normalized into that, into that way of life, uh, it, it does, it raises a lot of questions about, well, are, are, are they even going to be able to function like out in the real world or is the digital environment just going to just going to kind of take over? So you're not going to be forced into the matrix. You're going to leafly march your way into it. It's going to be like the Wally yeah. movie. You know, if anybody remembers that one with yeah, the, the people the that chairs. just sit in the chair and they and they have the mask. It's the, it's the brave new world type of society. All your basic needs are taken care of and you have the entertainment. What more do people want? Well, you know, for some of us, spirituality, meaning, you know, deeper purpose, stuff like that is kind of important, but we're really losing the ability to find a lot of that stuff. Here's the, here's the problem, though. I know that, that it's that every, what you're describing as far as the, the deeper meaning that you're looking for, ultimately, every human is searching for that. They just don't mm -hmm. appreciate that that's what they're searching for. And that's why they're merely existing and not living. And it's 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 no it's no better than the existence of a, of a cat. It's like, well, it's, there's no higher function. So, You're just existing. For, for me, I, I, so I was a philosophy major in school and I, I focused on, I focused on the Greeks. I was really into Plato and, and what you've described is what I kind of, I, I think of as the Alcibiades problem. It goes back to um, the Plato symposium. Alcibiades gives a speech where he talks about the whole problem is, you know, you know what you need to do. You know what your problem is. You know what you're doing wrong. How do you have the motivation you know, how, how do you how how do you do the right thing in spite of, you know, the 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 just temptation? It's so easy to go go down the path of, of what's easy. And that's really the problem that I think we continue to struggle with as a society is how do we support each other in making better decisions? How do we give each other inspiration to find meaning and find purpose and, and develop this stuff. I, I, I would like to think that there is room for that on social media. You know, it's part of, I, I flatter myself, what I'm trying to do is, is to help build supportive communities for people to be better. Uh, but I mean, I think, I really do think that's a legitimate question is, is the technology itself so detrimental? Good. It, but it's, it's so good at what, the, at what they're trying to do. I mean, they're trying to lure you in to stay there forever. And it's so powerfully effective at actually accomplishing that objective. Mm -hmm. So yeah, no, I sp spot on and kudos to you for making the world a, a little, and your corner of the world, a brighter place. For sure. Well, all of you here, I'm not taking all the credit. No, you should, you should. <laughs> we all deflect, we all deflect to Andrea. 
so, so I know uh, Phil's on a short timer, and I wanted to ask him a question if I can. Yeah, yes, I know he's out soon. So Phil, I you know I saw that the judge, uh, not surprisingly, probably denied the, the First Amendment dismissal uh, motions in the Trump case, and yeah. I'm wondering if the Court of Appeals takes the the case on the disqualification, which I think they should. Do you think they'll take up other collateral uh, or other issues at the same time, allow that to be appealed then go ahead and hear all of it or, or, or not? Yeah. So there's a, also another discretionary appeal. Uh, Judge McAfee is handing out, we call these uh, certificates of immediate review. He's handing them out like Halloween candy because he just gave one to uh, Harrison Floyd's lawyer, Harrison Floyd, had um, had appealed basically on the grounds that the Georgia State Election Board did not uh, exercise its uh, du- well, it has a, a, a duty under the, under state law to delegate out and refer uh, for prosecution any any crimes that they did, they feel exist related to elections, and it's almost like that's the only way uh, to to do it. And in other words, the argument is that DAs can't go out on their own and uh and do these uh, make these cases without the referral and so he got shot down the judge said no i'm gonna go, but i will let you appeal that so just yesterday um chris Kacheroff, who i interviewed a couple of nights ago on, on my channel inside the law it's a great interview and we broke some news by the way i want you guys to go uh look at it because he says he's gonna sue the pants off fanny willis if he wins this appeal because that means she had no jurisdiction he says he's gonna file a federal civil rights claim against him but anyway to your question, we've got so many of these uh, pre-trial uh, appeals. We call it the interlocutory appeals for those non-lawyers listening and watching. Because they know interlocutory better than than, than pre-trial. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. So, uh, but anyway, so <laughs> they uh, it's it's you know it's it's Friday afternoon. Sorry, I didn't mean to derail you there, brother. Right. Keep going. So good. yeah, so he, he's I think I think they're going to take up a lot of these issues pre-trial. We don't yet know if Fanny Willis herself is going to appeal uh where the judge, you know, dismissed several counts as it pertains to Trump and some of the others, just said like them, I'm dismissing those counts out of this indictment. She can take the indictment as it is, she can take it back to the grand jury and try to you know, re-indict the case, or she can take the judge up on appeal herself. So there's lots of things that may go up on appeal. Uh, I, I don't know if there's going to be an appeal filed by Steve Sadow on the First Amendment thing, however, because the judge said that he's willing to allow them to revisit this issue. In other words, is the speech protected by the First Amendment once he gets a more factualized record. It's hard for him to say in the abstract of knowing what facts the DA is going to accuse them of. Uh, it's hard to, It's hard for him to, to say if there's an as-applied First Amendment challenge that will work. So it's possible that Steve Sadow will also seek interlocutory appeal. I am of the belief that if it's a constitutional type thing and it's, it's what we call a plea in bar, that you don't need permission from the judge. It's directly appealable. I don't think Steve Sadow has made a decision on that, but uh, you know we'll have to wait and watch. Phil, did I see that this jurisdictional question, the judge actually certified it up, which is kind yeah. of, I mean, that's pretty extraordinary when the judge himself yeah. is saying, like, there's a substantial room for difference of opinion here. Yeah. Well, it's, it's almost like he's saying, it's almost like he's saying, help me hire courts. To it's, yeah, you know, it's, it's absolutely above my pay grade. First, it's a first impression. Our state election board, there's a, there's a state law that says that, you know, their job is to determine and it. And it basically exists so that we don't have a patchwork of DAs, uh, potentially bringing different cases around the state. It's sort of to centralize like the, the decision making on whether or not there's a need to prosecute anything related to how elections are run. And so uh, if if you the idea, the argument is for Harrison Floyd, if you don't have that certification or that referral from the state election board, then you, Mr. or Mrs. D.A., do not have any jurisdiction to even investigate, let alone indict this case. And so any number of these appeals, that one, uh, the one on disqualification, any one of all of those could be the death knell for this entire case. I do think that the Court of Appeals is going to take up the issue of 
disqualification. I don't see how they couldn't. A great amicus brief was filed yesterday that really, really powerfully pointed out how Georgia courts, even the Supreme Court going back uh, centuries, uh, has said, look, we've got to have faith in the results of the justice system. And when you have prosecutors going wild uh, and, you know, you just can't have faith in the result. If we're going to convict somebody, the public and the state has a, a, an interest in the public being confident that the system worked. As long as you're not in Fulton County. Yeah. <laughs> well, right. it's, a, gonna... it's a mess. It's a mess. Um, yeah, definitely. I'm going to shift to Sean, who's been really quiet a lot of the time. Yeah. Between Sean and Steve, they're having the yeah. uh, quiet battle. Yes. Uh, who, who's the most quiet? Um, you were talking before we came on. There's a case going on. George Kelly. Yes. So George Kelly is a rancher down in uh, southern Arizona. He actually like lives on the border. He's down like at the bottom end of Arizona. And part of his property and the properties nearby, like the border wall is right there, but it also ends. And through his property, um, according to him, he's seen groups of armed men going back and forth across the border. And then the last time this happened, he goes out and he says he fires a couple of warning shots at people who are armed and drove them away. Well, he calls the police. They come out, look, and everything's fine. Well, later they find a guy, a dead guy out in the brush. Uh, who's got a bullet hole in him and he's got like binoculars a walkie talk. He's got a radio, like a handheld radio, all that stuff. And coyote, uh, he's dread. Well, he's, he's dre not somebody going to, you know, look for the American dream as the prosecutors are attempting to call it. He was involved in something. He was a scout for somebody doing something. Now, whether it was uh, smugglers, coyotes, the cartels, or what the border patrol calls like a rip crew, which is the idea of, uh, Kind of like Omar and the Wire, they're stick-up boys. They go and knock off the cartels and the drug runners themselves. Now, the car the Border Patrol has said, like, there hasn't been as much of that activity around the area. But he very likely could have been, you know, involved in guiding people across. And those guys do tend to be armed at times. So he got charged with the murder, but they haven't proven, you know, yeah, he fired some shots. They haven't proven what shot did it, what caliber bullet killed this guy, anything of that nature. And it's actually been a, it's it's an ongoing case, and it's not the strongest case at all. Um, they don't really have any super big bombshell evidence they presented so far. Uh, hmm. They called his wife up, for example, and this eighty five year old lady is just tearing a new a hole in the prosecutor while she's up there on the stand. It was really well done. Um, it was it was very weird because then the defense gets up there and says like, "Oh, hi, Wanda, how are you doing?" And they talk back and forth for over like four hours and it's just really, really nice conversation. Um, the sad thing is it's such a big deal. Like long crime quit covering it and all mm. the people that were covering all the news stations quit covering it on a daily basis. Apparently one or two are kind of live streaming it here and there. Is but that, is that for ratings problems? I, I, like not enough viewers? I think they claim it's ratings, but I, I don't know if there's a political issue there because it certainly is a very political prop like case. I mean, the, the, mm -hmm. I think the biggest problem why this, you know, this guy lives in a county that went 70 percent Biden. Mm. I, I do think there is a bit of a factor there into this. If, if it had been another county that was, you know, red leaning, I don't know if they would have charged this. Uh, but we it's a very uh, it, I'm not impressed. And I mean, we see a bunch of these cases where you're like, why did the prosecutor bring this? Uh, this one really is. This one really is bad. Now, I will say on the plus side, he hasn't been sitting in jail for a year or so because he's in his seventies. I probably would have killed him, but yeah, the, it is, a, it's an ongoing case and it's, it's kind of a travesty that they're actually trying this guy. Do they have uh, ballistics or anything? No, I mean, no, they found it. Well, wow. George Kelly out patrols is he's got a hundred acres and he's out walking the hundred acre, or, you know, hundred acre scrub land. And he finds a dead Mexican guy and like, Oh, okay. He calls the police and it's a couple days later. And they're like, yeah, he's dead. That's it. That's all they have. <laughs> Wow. Now, now there's a guy who claims to be with them when somebody shot. Um, so his like one of this guy's friends was allegedly there with him, but his story is super sketch. The guy is a the, the guy's from Honduras. He's down in Mexico, and he's not being he's being promised basically. It sounds like we won't send you, the Mexicans won't send you back to Honduras if you promise to come testify. Like they had to go back across the border to go. The marshals had to go get him. 
hmm. and bring him back. Like, and and it's weird because the guy's uh, entry wounds, the ballistics, all they know is it, the shot comes like up through the like through the chest and out the back at like a high angle. So this guy was no more than <clears throat> at probably. 200 yards away, which there's no way like a shot's going to shoot up and down like that. It looks a lot more and more like whoever the group of people he was with smoked him mm -hmm. and yeah. left him because otherwise it doesn't make any sense that George Kelly did this. And it does sound like he fired some warning shots. Now I can only say this guys do not do warning shots. I cannot stress that enough. If you're going to put in work, you better put in the work. Don't do warning shots, please. Oh, is that one of those cases where, like, if you shoot somebody to wound, you're in trouble because you're obviously well, not in enough danger that yeah. you have to shoot to kill to prove that you are in danger and well, that is legitimate self-defense? I, that I kind mean, of thing? It, it, it's kind of, but it's also just if you're cranking off shots, where are they going? And where this guy lives, it's all a bunch of dense scrub. Like, like you've been down in Arizona, right, Eric? I'm, you know, you I got was all born and raised in Tucson. Okay, yeah, that's what I thought. Like, you know, so it, this is down in no, near Nogales, so that's mm -hmm. if that helps. Like, there's scrubland and there's brush everywhere. Well, you don't crank off shots. Like, who's out there? You know, what's out there? Well, actually, um, people who live in Arizona absolutely do, Sean. Yeah. So, <laughs> no, 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 no yeah. offense, but it, it, it's like, yeah. it's usually miles before you see I understand. Anyone. I understand that. So. But still, like, you should you should generally try to avoid doing that. Now, his situation, I mean, because he fired off shots, and now there's a dead body on your property, now you've got now now it's up to him and his attorney to explain it away. Whereas if he hadn't fired shots, this would be a lot easier for him to say. Well, I, I don't know. Do. Ballistics would seem to help. I mean, it's mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. you have his gun, you mm -hmm. have a body, you have bullets. So... Did, did they get the bullet though? I'm not sure. No, nope, they, they don't that. have. They don't have. They yeah. don't have the bullet. No they bullet. just have a body with a hole in it. And well, no that's their problem. Yeah, no, I, I agree. Yeah, but I, the I ballistics would enable them to match the striations to see. Well, oh, that that's all they that's say. All, that's <laughs> that's, that's what I, all voodoo. That's what that's what my they TV taught me. They can do some and that's say what my it's TV this gun. <laughs> Tool mark analysis is like Ouija it's board trash. level. It's now. CIA trash. says, but, damn it. Uh, but, uh, uh, well, the <laughs> don't CIA argue with what my TV taught me. Eric, I'm just saying, yes, it's the state's problem, but guess what? The state has now indicted you, and now you have to fight against a murder charge so yes it's the state's problem but now you're on for the ride so it's like there's a smart way of handling it there's and well, i'm not advising people to shoot in the air yeah. but i just i'm i oh, question I why trouble. charges are even brought i because, mean I, I thought that charges had to be brought if there was a probability of a uh, case well, so, you know most da's avoid uh, doing the probable that. cause standard is the bare minimum the, mm -hmm. so remember like beyond reasonable doubts like 85 90 percent probable cause is like 30 percent like yeah we kind of think maybe it happened that's that's the only requirement is that you have a probable cause standard to bring is it trial. is it is it even probable cause or reasonable suspicion i'm, I'm being serious the the model the model rules and i think most states say probable cause is the standard no but i'm it's saying is this right. case probable cause oh i mean there's enough probable cause the guy admits cranking off rounds and there's a dead body on his property that would be enough to like that's enough to get a warrant at that point. And that's probable cause. Like, I think there's enough probable, like there's enough probable cause. This guy did not help himself by cranking off rounds. And then like, Oh yeah, dead body. Now I'm also not saying if you live out in Arizona, you know, shoot shovel and shut up is not a bad strategy, but you know, you have to be careful about it. If you're going to do that. Well, well. I mean, did he fire the same direction that the body was found? You know, no, he says like, he didn't, he disavow, says he didn't, but disavow, remember, disavow, it's him. Disavow. I just so, know anything. This gentleman <laughs> just said, this gentleman over here just said, well, okay, so essentially the, the number one rule is that uh, he should, um, STFU, should have never said a word um, yeah. and said, hey, well, will you look at that? Where did that come from? Yeah, I mean, like if I lived out in Arizona and found a body, it's like, well, I'm not going to dig it up, but I'm like, huh. And just like, I mean, at that point, I'd, I'd ignore it. And then come back a couple months later, like, oh, wow, it's really deteriorated. You can't tell anything. No, no, I meant I, I would maybe call uh, the police, but I wouldn't necessarily say, oh, you know, I was uh, well, firing some rounds in the air and I happened to find well, this. <laughs> but no, because you already did oh, that. Then like a couple days police. later, you found the body is the problem. So mm. nobody found the body till till days afterwards. That's mm. the problem here. Because he already called 911 and said there are armed men on my property and I'm going to go defend the homestead. Mm. So the police showed up, the border patrol showed up. 
they all came out like armed to the teeth, ready to fight. And that's part of the problem. And then later on, he calls him and says, Hey guys, guess what? I found a body out here with a bullet hole in it. I have a question. Is he the only person who uh, fired any kind of shots of any kind? Yeah, because he's the only guy. It's, he's a guy like a hundred acre ranch. There's nobody else around. The well, well, you Patrol, said Border Patrol could yeah, have, uh, the police. Well, no, no. Have, but at the time they showed up, he said they're gone. And okay. yeah, that like that's like I said, that's where you got to be careful because if you set yourself up to fail, mm -hmm. uh, he kind of did a little bit. And the thing is, he, it's a seventy percent Democrat county. It's like that shouldn't surprise you either. Yeah, maybe, 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 maybe. <sighs> Again, I was born in Tucson, which is heavily yeah. Democrat, but it's very two A oriented. You know, not not all Democrats hate guns. There, there, there are Democrats. Who, oh, well, I'm not. I'm not worried about the guns. It's the Democrats supporting, you know, an issue of immigration. I, I understand that, but even yeah. there, there is a tear um, mm -hmm. in the community because. Yes, we support immigration, sort of, unless they're taking our jobs, whether we're Democrat or not. You know, it, this is. The environment in Arizona is very different than other places, and the even mm -hmm. between Tucson and Nogales is is going to be different. And I, and I don't know; it's hard to explain like the desert, what it's like out there, how sparse a hundred acres actually is, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. all of that. It, it, it's just a whole different environment. So I don't know. It sounds like yeah, he made some mistakes. I. I question I think whether, uh, uh, really. if there's even enough there, but mm -hmm. let's go and close out with the, um, where we've got random shooting. So let's move on to the river stabbing case with Steve Southern law. Yeah. So that case in Wisconsin is really about self-defense because there's no question, but that the guy stabbed these people because he's on video doing it, even though he tried to hide that fact from law enforcement before he was arrested. Um, there's no question, right? So it, it's interesting because he went over to these teenagers. He's a guy in his 50s, and he, he had this weird affect to him, and he really wasn't talking to them. And then the teenagers start yelling at him, and an altercation begins, and he's knocked down in the in the water and uh, pushed mm -hmm. and stuff. And his response is to start the stabbing, which he did. Successfully stabbed five people, killed one of them, cut one guy open, and stuff falling out of him. It's The video is, is crazy. Then he walks away. I mean, he literally just walks away and gets back with his group and they get on their inner tubes and go down the river. Right. But the police are there pretty quickly and he, he ends up uh, being taken in. And uh, so, again, the question is, is, is self-defense. And the, the state has been making a big deal out of he punched one of the teen or young uh, women. And she might have been in her 20s first. Um, and I, I don't I didn't see that in the video, him punching this this woman. And nobody was saying that apparently at the beginning. But there was contact between them. I guess that's to to make him the instigator to reduce his ability to claim self-defense because it is clear on the video that he was struck and knocked into the water, then hit in the face while he was in the water, while he was surrounded by screaming and, mm -hmm. and yelling people. And then the whole question is going to be, you know, does the jury buy that uh, he was put into reasonable fear, I suppose, of his life in order to go on this uh, intense stabbing spree that he did? But certainly one of the guys he stabbed was in the process of hitting him while he was in the water. I don't know about all five of them, though. One of them was one of the females. I think she got stabbed in the side. Mm -hmm. hmm. Yeah, but I, I don't feel at, at that point when you're a whole group of people and you start beating on somebody like I'm sure he's just anybody. Like if you're close enough to get stabbed, you were very likely you could have reasonably been perceived as uh, some people are beating on me. You're catching this no matter where you are. So I, I don't feel like all the people in that case, these kids, they're like 17, 18 year olds who are all, they all admit they're liquored up. Oh yeah. Like, yeah. Everybody's high, they're high, everybody. they're drunk. Oh yeah. They're, they're aggressive. Yeah. That's all, that's all right there on the video. Right. Yeah. And, and it's, and they're, and it's funny because like the one of them that comes out there, you know, they're all like, Oh, my friend's dead. It's like, so why were you out there? Like this guy, why were you screaming this 50 year old guy's a pedophile and a rapist? He's like, Oh, I don't know. Oh, like, you're killing me, dude. Can we use other terms? No, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, they were. They, 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 I'm sorry. They definitely but had they, uh, instigators involved yeah. in their in their group. Oh. And and the weird yeah. thing is, of course, he was he was finished stabbing everybody before they yeah. realized they were getting stabbed, right? Yeah. And and, and then all of a sudden yeah. they realize we all just got stabbed. And it goes yeah. from taunting him and yelling at him mm -hmm. to, oh my God, we better get oh, yeah. away from this guy. He's dangerous. And yeah. he just saunters off. That's right. By the way, did. that's a valid point. A lot of people do not understand how actually deadly 
a knife is. is. There and there are there's studies and videos and oh, everything um, covering how within 20 feet a a person with a knife is yeah. more dangerous than somebody yeah. with a with a gun. And, and and he's got Nikolai Mew is the defendant. He's got a really good attorney, but his uh, second chair is Corey Shirafasi from Kyle Rittenhouse's trial, and he has been doing devastating cross examination of all these kids and yeah, they admit like they were liquored up. The kid who died was like at a point two, two and yeah, they're, they're talking all kinds of crap. They're acting like a bunch of yahoos. Like it's a TikTok video. And then all of a sudden they're like, Oh my God, I'm bleeding. And they're screaming right after it. And it's like, you know, these guys wanted to mess around and they found out. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, and I'm not saying it because I've seen some people say, Oh my God, why did he bring a knife while he was going on a river? Where, where do you go when you don't have a knife? I mean, that by yeah. itself is not inculpatory to me in any way. Yeah. That's whether he should have been stabbing or not. And I also think just because you have superior numbers, it can be dangerous to assume that nothing bad yes. is going to happen to you. And there, that's a, a message from this story. Yes. Do, do we know if this, is this a duty or to retreat jurisdiction or, uh, or no, do we know? It's I don't, they, they have been talking about it at the trial though. Like he could have walked away. They could have mm -hmm. walked away, but I'm not, I'm not sure yeah. what the law is. on. I, it. I don't think it's, I think it's Wisconsin. So I think it's just like for Kyle Rittenhouse, he didn't have a duty to retreat. And yeah. But by that point too, when the fight's on though, you're not ex like once they start attacking, you know, the duties out the window and yeah, it, it's, you know, and even then it's like you carrying a knife. It's a tool. Yeah. Everybody right. should have a knife right. all the time. Yeah. I mean, Come on. No, I, I agree. I mean, but, yeah, he could have picked up a rock out of the river and started stoving in skulls, and that could have. And, and who cares if he had a knife? I mean, I, I'm being serious. I, yeah. what, what's the problem? I mean, does he yeah, work with boxes? Um, yeah, whatever. I, I used well, to walk around with a Gerber all the time, a multi-tool unit. You don't know how handy that thing yeah. is. And yes, there is a blade as part of it. Yeah, but, I mean, that's just getting ridiculous. Yeah. All right. Well, that's a perfect, calm, wonderful, laid back thing. We've, you know, we've gone from um, interesting representation to knifing multiple people on a <laughs> beside a river. People, you have to admit the show has range and you definitely want to subscribe or if you're on X, follow or if you're on Rumble, follow whatever the code word is for the time. It's free to do it, and why not? These are really great conversations, and I'm very fortunate to have such amazing people here who are far smarter than I'll ever be. So, Sean, what do you have coming up? Um, right now, well, we're going to try to see if we can keep watching the George Kelly trial. Um, I found a way to watch it, so we're going to try to catch up with that today and tomorrow. Um, you can find me over Potentially Criminal. We'll also be trying to watch Nikolai Mew, try to catch up with some parts of that because that's a really good one as well to watch. Um, and, uh, yeah, if you catch me on the locals, we'll be watching the Japanese Grand Prix this weekend. So that'll be fun, too, for Formula One. So that, that that's what's going on with me. All right, great. Andrea, thank you so much as usual. I'm so, I, I almost, I'm, I'm looking forward to you having content on your own channel, but I feel like I'm kind of spoiled by the fact you're like, well, I need to get something out there. So I'm coming on there. So I'm, thank you. I'm truly benefiting from, from you showing up. Thank you. Well, it's, it's my pleasure. I, I really enjoy being here and I actually have, I got my channel back to life just yesterday. In fact, uh, I did my first ever live stream, which I had never done. I was a little nervous about Ooh. it. It's a whole different uh, skill set to do this, you know, hosting on the fly thing than it is to, you know, sit back comfortably with my not script, but you know, I, I know where I'm going and stuff like that. So anyway, I was, I was a little intimidated by that, but we got through it and uh, seemed like it went pretty well. So it was a great time. Looking forward to doing more stuff like that. Uh, I'm going to try to do it again next week for the, you know, the follow up on the Coburger hearing. We'll, we'll go ahead and, and follow that. And then uh, looking forward down the road, uh, I am trying my best to get caught up as much as I can on what's going on with the Karen Reed case. Uh, I'm very interested in following that trial if in fact it does end up going forward, uh, I think it's scheduled to start uh, April 17th or, or somewhere in that ballpark. So I'm going to be keeping an eye out for that and uh, potentially doing some uh, some live streaming for that too. So find me on uh, Twitter or on YouTube at Abercart Law and uh, I'll have some stuff for you now. 
All right, Steve, this is becoming a new tradition that all of a sudden the lights dim when you're going to close out. Are you shutting it down? Last call? I think it's the early eclipse here in Raleigh, but I'm all natural light in the office now since we're getting ready to move. So it, it, I'm at the mercy of whatever happens. And uh, speaking of Andrea's channel, that's a great case to listen to her on because the litigation matters and the Koberger case, pretty high level intellectually, right? Uh, they're interesting issues, whichever side you may think you, you are on the case in terms of whether he's guilty or not. But the what they're arguing about is, is very interesting to me, I think. Uh, so, but I, I may get a chance to take a look at the Allen case and do something on that to try and look at what's happening in that too, because that one is, that's that's not what's happening in Coburger. The things in the Allen mm -hmm. case are the, from a from a judge standpoint, it's a little more bizarre than and not as straightforward as as the as the judge is trying to handle it in Coburger. So hopefully I get to that. But um, but I know you know we talked about this earlier. Joe's got something really important to talk about, so I'm going to shut up and let him get to that. Oh, oh. well, I'll, okay. I, pre I appreciate that. The Trump trial is 10 days away. It will not be televised. On the New York law, it's actually prohibited from being televised. I am fortunately situated within striking distance via, via local transportation to be attending the hearing. And I will be attending that hearing and providing whatever insight and perspectives I can as to how that's progressing. And you, I need, I'm urging you all to follow me at goodlogic.locals.com. That's goodlogic.com dotlocals.com. Again, that's only starting in 10 days. So